lot of a lot of attention can sometimes be about us, but it's really all about you. And today, we just want to give you center stage. We want to give you the attention that you deserve. Uh, you are God. You are Redeemer. You are Rescuer. You love our love our soul. You love us, and we're so grateful that you were willing to grace us with your presence and your power, and that you came to this place and to demonstrate your love for us. We're so grateful. What a gift. What a gift. And we just want to give you praise. God, this morning, um, inevitably, somebody is going through some tough times in our church family because life still happens, even when it can be very difficult. And we do pray, God, that, that whatever uh, folks are going through in this room, that maybe they're going through some tough times, some very challenging times, that they would know that you care, that your, your hand is on their shoulder, your arms are wrapped around them, and that you love them, and that you're going to watch over them and encourage them along the journey. God, we love you, and we have exalted your name, and, and now we ask that your spirit would just visit us and speak to us and move in our lives, in our hearts and minds, right now as we contemplate moving forward in the story of, of, what, of, of, your, of your story of, for our lives. We give you glory and honor and praise. And it's in your son's name that we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Be seated. All right. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, certainly appreciate it. And uh, we know that uh, it gets a little bit crazy uh, the, the week after Christmas. And so uh, uh, thanks for being here. It's good to see you all. I was sitting up front and you sound great this morning. Your voices. Just tell the person next to you, you are really great. All right. It's probably the first time you've said that to them, right? Maybe today. Maybe today. Anyways, um, we did. We had a great Christmas Eve service, and I'm uh, uh, certainly thrilled. And uh, thanks, Becky. I don't know if Becky's around today. Is she here today? It, she's. I know she was getting under the weather, and that's a lot of stress. And make sure you send her a note and say thanks for serving in that capacity. It was such a, a great night. Well, we're going to be wrapping up this series called Ponder. It's all about pondering the Christmas story. And uh, if you'll notice in Luke chapter 2, verse 19, that's been our key verse for the whole month. And uh, it says that Mary, look at it with me. It says this. It says, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And we've been talking about the Christmas story. And, and, uh, and that she is pondering. In that moment, she is pondering all the, all the stuff that's happened up to that point. And what a great story it's been. You have maybe have a nativity uh, scene set up. And it's all about all these things that are kind of taking place and happening. And, uh, and the interesting thing is we're moving just past now the birth. And Jesus has been born and the, the shepherds stop by. And um, it's, it's that day after feeling. It's when all the Christmas celebrations are over, it's like, like real life is, it, or life is about to come back, right? It's like, uh, you're in the season, and everybody's, everybody's kind and generous and smiling, and then when Christmas is over, it's kind of like everybody gets back to real life, and, and it can be a little, a little depressing, right? Because it's like, uh, people that maybe were really smiling and, and happy and generous and patient, or maybe not so much now. We were coming back from seeing a movie on Christmas Day. It was Christmas afternoon, and everybody had gone to see Star Wars. And we were we wanted to see it. We waited till later on Christmas Day, and we went out and saw the movie. On the way home, we were driving on one on twenty coming back to our place, and and I knew that Christmas was over by the bozo behind me. And I'm not talking about Luke. I mean, he seriously sits behind me, all right. But I'm not talking about him. But this guy was driving, and he was a little bit intense, and he. He's driving, and he's really close because it's dark, and the lights are on, and you can see he's pulling up, he's slowing down, he's pulling up, he's slowing down. He's looking over to my side to see if anybody's in front of me, and I'm watching all this. I'm sitting here driving. I'm driving the speed limit. I really am. I'm driving the speed limit. It's a really important thing. I, I mean, since coming to Brighton Chapel, I've, I've been pulled over more times in Brighton than I've ever been in my entire life. So I watch, I watch the speedometer. There you go. Yeah, I watch it all the time. And so we're, I'm driving to this guy, and you can tell this guy's like agitated by me. And I'm like, dude, it's Christmas. Where do you gotta go? Slow down, chill out, relax. And I'm driving, and decide, he decides, 
he's going to whip around me. And all of a sudden, you can see it coming a mile away. And he's, he's pulling up and he's like kind of hanging front right beside me a little bit, letting me know that I was inconveniencing him. And then he decided to pull ahead. I decided I'm going to speed up. And I'm, I'm like, I'm going down. If he's going down, I'm going down too, so we're going down. 120, and uh, he ends up passing me and all this kind of stuff, and I thought, welcome to real life, right? <laughs> it's the day after Christmas, and it's like all this stuff, it's like after, after the presents have been given, and the cookies have been ate, and, uh, you know, the traveling is over, family goes back to their homes, everybody kind of goes back to life as usual, right? I think the same thing was going on for Mary, and I think Luke wanted to kind of say, it's not over. It's not over. I, I, I want to remind you that the story doesn't end the day after Christmas, the day after his birth. When, when all the lights go out, and you start thinking about, uh, i got to box all this stuff back up, and wait for a few more months for this to all come back out. Some of you are talking about leaving it up for the rest of the year, because you know it just gets to be a little complicated. But it's life after Christmas, and it's kind of like, what is the next step? And Luke records kind of the next step. And I think there's some things that we can learn from it, okay? Uh, what's the next step after Christmas? And I want you to notice, it's in Luke chapter 2, look at verse 21. So Mary has just given birth, and it says this in Luke chapter 2, verse 21. On the eighth day, okay, so this is, this is eight days later. So she gives birth day one, and then seven days later, this is the eighth day. So when, when all the angels are back in heaven, shepherds are back out into the fields, no more angel visits, every, all the lights are turned off, um, this is what's next. It says, when it was time to circumcise him, he was, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. Now, in Jewish tradition, this was a, a major part of their lives, where on the eighth day, um, these folks are going to celebrate, celebrate tradition. On this day is when they will name him, but also this boy, because he's a boy, he will also be circumcised. This all goes back to Genesis chapter 17. Keep your finger there. So I'm going to take you to a few places um, where it's at. Genesis chapter 17. Look at it with me. It says this. When Abram, okay, look at it. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, in verse 1, he says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram faced, fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be called what? Yeah, Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. To be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. <clears throat> then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be what? Yeah. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is, how old? Is eight days old, must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a, from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. So for them, this is like normal tradition. They're like, listen, we love God. We love Him. We are His people. He's our God. And what He wants is what He gets. See, this is at the heartbeat of Joseph and Mary. 
See, you got to see them. They're not just like all excited just because an angel showed up, said you're going to have a baby. Even after the angels had left, they still want to please God. God says, hey, listen, on the eighth day, you go and you circumcise him. And as a result, this is a sign, an outward sign, that you're mine and I'm yours. And see, what he's saying is, I want this to be the kind of relationship that you and I have. This is this covenant that we are making. So on the eighth day, they circumcise the boy, and then this is when they give him the name Jesus. Jesus meaning Jehovah is salvation. So here they know, it's like they're given a name to tell him, and this is the name that he's supposed to be to receive. Now, they've been told by the angel and the shepherds and all this stuff that he's going to be a ruler and he's going to reign and all this kind of stuff. And it's like absolutely huge. Did they understand what was about to come their way? What kind of a life that he would experience? Not necessarily. But what they do know is that he is a, a rescuer, a redeemer, a savior. And that Jehovah, God, is salvation. And this is his name. So when the time, verse 22, look at it. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now for them, so they do this thing. They're very tradition based. I mean, tradition, they're really going to do this. And they're, they love God and they want to follow him. And, and they say, at, at, at the eighth day, this is when you do this. But there's also rules for when they're to come and dedicate their child to the Lord. And, 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 and give him a sacrifice to redeem him. And I want you to see this in Luke cha uh, Leviticus chapter 12. So again, turn, there, turn back to the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 12. This is this tradition that they're keeping. Leviticus chapter 12. And starting at, uh, look at uh, verse 2. Um, he says, The Lord said to Moses, Say, say to the Israelites, A woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be ceremonially unclean for seven days, just as she is unclean during her monthly period. On the eighth day, the boy is to be what? Again, he's reminding them. Then the woman must wait 33 days to be purified from her bleeding. She must not touch anything sacred or go to the sanctuary until the days of her purification are over. If she gives birth to a daughter, for two weeks the woman will be unclean as during uh, her period. Then she must wait 66 days to, to be purified from her bleeding. So she's got to wait 40 days for the boy. She's got to wait 80 days for the girl. Because girls are just, you know, you guys are difficult and all this kind of stuff. Boys, they're just special. They're neat. All right, so they don't have to wait so long. Anyway, when the days of her purification for a son or daughter are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting a year old what? For a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. He shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her and then she will be ceremonially clean uh, from her flow of blood. These are the regulations for the woman who gives birth to a boy or to a girl. If she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons one for the burnt offering and one for the sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her and she will be clean. So here, in this tradition, here they come and they want to bring the child before the Lord. And, and, and he talks about in Exodus that there's like this, when you bring him before the Lord, it is saying, listen, that, that this is the gift that you've given to us and we are coming back to give him to you. We are making a dedication of this little boy. And as a response, they give this offering. And so, and then the priest says, Every, everything's good. You can now go home. See, what Luke is trying to say is this. Listen, he's trying to say that this little boy, that he belongs to the Lord. That this little guy that was born in Bethlehem, this little boy that was born to Mary and Joseph, listen, his life is a dedication to the Lord. This is, this, is the, this is God. He belongs to Him. See, if there's anything that He wants you to get, if there's anything that Luke wants you to see, is that, that Jesus is dedicated to service 
to, to, to God. That his life is not just a little baby and the miraculous birth, but that his life is dedicated to the Lord. See, I love when parents dedicate their children to the Lord. For them, this is how they would do it. For us, we, you give us a call and we, you say, I want to dedicate my little one to the Lord. And so we set up a time, we show some pictures, and it's really beautiful, a great time. Then we come up to the front and we have you introduce yourself and, and you get to say, here's this little baby boy or this little baby girl. And, and then we, we do a prayer of dedication. And what we're saying to the couple is, they're saying, listen, I want to bring this baby and, and I just want to dedicate him or her to the Lord, that they are a gift from God, and that I, I pray, I pray that their life would be dedicated to Him. And, and so we pray this prayer of dedication, that mom and dad would raise this little one, um, these, these little ones to be dedicated to the Lord, and then we do that as well. We, we, we say, you're not alone. We come around you, and we believe we're with you. And as a church family, we're convinced there's three things that we want to do, and they start with L. They all start with L. We like to alliterate things, but it's really easy to remember. The first thing is this, that we hope for your kids, for your little ones, to grow up in this church, is that they would learn more about Jesus. That's what we desperately want. We want them to come and we want them to be a part of what's going on here because we want them to know who Jesus is. We want to, we open up this book and we say, listen, if there's anything you can learn, now granted, you got to learn your ABCs, you got to learn math, you got to learn science, you got to learn all that stuff. But if there's anything, anything that we want you to know about it, Jesus, we want you to learn more about him. And that's our desperate plea. As, as leaders at, in this church, we, we pray that you would do your best to get your kids here. Now, we hope that you'll do that at home as well. We hope that you'll take some time, find a children's Bible. They're actually a lot of fun to read, you know? Some of you are like, forget it. I want the kids' Bible. Those are really cute pictures. But find a Bible, read it at home, but do your best, parents, to get your kids here. Because we want to teach them about Jesus. We want them to learn about Him. And then in the hopes of learning more about Him, the second L is that they will fall in love with Him. That they will find out how much He loves them. And that they will be like, I, I, I love Him. I love Him. You know, we make cinnamon rolls every Christmas morning. And I love cinnamon rolls. But I love, I love Jesus too. And it's like, I, I want people to fall in love with Him. And I want your kids to fall in love with Him. And when they learn more about Him and fall in love with Him, our hope is that they would want to live their lives for Him. That's our hope. So when you think about Carrie Mock and Karen Schmidt that, that minister to our kids and all of their team, remember that what they do is not just because they have nothing else better to do. It's because they love your kids. They love my kids. They want them to learn and fall in love and want to live their lives for Jesus. So get your kids to church. Amen? No? Okay, the new year, that's what you need to think about and make sure to have it. What Luke is trying to say is, Mary and Joseph needed to remember that this little boy is just a little boy, but he's dedicated to the Lord. He is this little boy that God sent this miracle baby, but he is dedicated to the Lord. His life is dedicated to him. Doesn't end there. While they're there at the temple, it says in verse 25, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, okay, and who was a righteous and who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. This was a normal prayer. They're, they're praying, God, we're waiting for the consolation of Israel. We're waiting for the Savior to come. There are people that would regularly pray this prayer in Jewish tradition. And it says, the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Another word for Messiah or Savior. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. So while they're coming in to just dedicate him to the Lord, here comes this guy. His name's Simeon. And they see each other. Somehow they must cross paths. And Simeon took him in his arms and praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. He says, for my eyes have seen your salvation, for which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a life for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory 
to your people, Israel. I mean, this is a huge moment for him. He's like been waiting for this. And this guy, Simeon, what we know about him, tradition says he was about 113 years old. They don't know exactly, but that's what tradition says. And, and we'll just go with that. But this is a pretty old guy. And this guy, he is like influenced, led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has major influence in his life. So much so that he was led by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit spoke to him. There's some people that you think, man, they're a little bit weird. Right? It's like, oh, the Holy Spirit said this to me. The Holy Spirit said that. Told me to do this. Told me to go there. That's Simeon. And as you maybe kind of look at some people a little bit kind of cross-eyed, like, I'm not too sure what to think about that. This guy loved God and was influenced by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said to him, however that works, he says to him, listen, you're going to see him. You're going to see the Savior. You're going to see him. And Simeon, and Simeon's like, okay, whenever, I'm praying, I'm waiting. And the guy says, listen, Simeon, if there's ever a time to go to the temple, it's now. It's now. Simeon goes, oh, okay, let's go to the temple. He walks into the temple, runs into Mary and Joseph, just bringing in their little baby. Somewhere in the outer court, they run in, their paths cross. And God whispers in his ear, he's the one. He's the one. And Simeon says, can I hold your baby? And he holds his baby, their baby. And he says, I can now die in peace. I have held the very one that we have been waiting for. He says, for my eyes have seen him. My eyes have seen him. Pictures don't do justice, do they? I mean, they're, they're better than nothing. But Simeon got to see him face to face. <laughs> Simeon got to look into those beauty little eyes and say, I know, I know, I know who you are. He says he is a, a revelation to the Gentiles. He is going to reveal God's love and God's truth to the rest of the world. And he's going to use his people Israel to be the launching pad. I mean, this is an amazing moment for them. Amazing moment. When the lights are down and the angels leave, God brings this, this older gentleman to cross paths with them. And see, just in case, just in case, you start to get a little bit cranky, just in case, you start to wonder, was all of this real? I want to remind you that it's real. That all of it is true. Well, how does Mary and Joseph respond? Look at verse 33. The child's father and mother, what did they do? They marvel at what was said about him. See, I think for them, they just need to be reminded when everybody goes home, when all the lights go out and stuff goes back in the boxes, they just need to be reminded it doesn't end here. It doesn't end here. This little baby is dedicated to the Lord and he is going to do the miraculous. He is going to be a miraculous Savior. How does he know that? Because in verse 34, look, then Simeon blessed them. Can I bless you? Let me bless you. He says to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword, hey, a sword will pierce your own soul. See, what, Sam, what Simeon is trying to say to her is that this one that has come, he is going to come as a savior. He, people are either going to believe him or they're going to be tripped up by him. Some are going to say, yes, I get it. Yes, I believe. But then there's others that are going to say, forget it. He's just a little baby. He's going to come and he's going to speak the truth. He's going to reveal the human heart and he's going to show the miraculous. That's what he's saying as a sign. This miraculous signs are not just going to be speaking the truth, but he's going to back it up with power. He's going to show you that it really is sent from God, that he is the savior of the world. He's, he's, this is it. This is the one. He's going to polarize people. 
People are going to be talking about him. People are going to be mesmerized by him. People are going to be messed up by him. People are going to say, I can't stop thinking about him. This one, he is going to disturb the rest of humanity. I mean, you think about it. We, When he came, what did he do? He split time because we, we, we look at BC standing for what? Yeah, what does the AD stand for? Yeah. It's kind of like everything. Now, we have a, a culture that's saying, now listen, let's just, uh, let's kind of do the B, C, E, or C. Let's kind of change that. So if we don't believe in Christ, if we don't believe in this baby, we've got to have something that, that like excludes him. But he has come. He didn't ask, can I split time? Can I call it AD? Can I, can I say BC and now AD? He didn't. He just showed up. This little baby is going to change the world. He is going to be a miraculous saver. And Luke is saying, listen, I need to remind you, this little baby, he's not just a little baby. He is, his life is dedicated to the Lord. <clears throat> and that he is a miraculous savior. And Mary, Mary, believe me, if you follow him, you believe in him, your soul, you will experience and you will not be spared the pain that he's going to go through. You will, you will walk through it as well. Followers of Jesus, you will experience trouble. And didn't Jesus say that? In following him, you're not exempt from the pain of the good news. So while they're talking, and it, it, it says here, verse 36, it says, there was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phineal, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. So she's a pretty old lady. She never left where? She never left the temple. It says, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. I mean, this is a godly woman. This is a woman who loves God and dedicated her life to the Lord. And she's there at the temple. And it says, coming up to them. The coming up to them is, you've got Mary and Joseph and Jesus. You've also got Simeon. Now, however this happens, we really don't know. Luke does not explain it. Mary must not tell him how. Or maybe Mary, Mary doesn't even really realize how this is happening. But somehow, Anna is aware of the conversation. And Anna's aware of what's going on in this moment about this little baby. And it says, coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. You see, Anna, this widow, this 84-year-old woman, she knows that one day the Savior is going to come. And she's also with a group of people. There's a people around there that believe one day, as God promised, a Redeemer is going to come. And they're holding on to that fact the day is going to come. And she hears all of this trans, transpiring with, with Simeon. She's going, oh my word, could this be? And she's aware and she sees this and hears this. She comes up, she's excited. She gives thanks to God. Oh, the Savior has come. She's like, guys, guys, he's here. He's here. The one that we've been waiting for. And I think Luke is trying to say, listen, not only is his life dedicated to the Lord, not only is he a miraculous Savior, but that his life is a tangible message of God's mercy and grace. That God up there came down here. And the very Jesus that prayed, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think for her she's saying, he's come, he's come. The tangible message of God's mercy and God's grace. See, John writes this in 1 John in his letter in 1 John chapter 1. He says this, 1 John chapter 1, if you want to turn there, you can. But this is what John writes in 1 John chapter 1, the one that walked with Jesus. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have what? Have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life, Jesus, appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this 
to make our joy complete. See, what he's saying is, listen, that his life is, is a tangible message of God's mercy and God's grace. That we got to see him and we got to hold him. And even John is saying, listen, we have to tell you this. And this makes our joy complete. Because if we just held on to this, it's, it, it, it's meant to go beyond us. And Luke is like, I just don't want you to miss this. After all the lights are turned off and all the, all the stuff is taken down, remember, this little baby was dedicated to the Lord and his life was in dedication to his service. That his life wouldn't stop being a baby, but he would grow up and be a miraculous Savior. And that his life would be a tangible message so that we can get a hold of it, of God's mercy and God's grace. And as Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them if they don't know what they're doing. A message of mercy and grace. So I've got three questions for you. As we go into the new year, three questions for you to consider. Would you consider these three questions? Would you consider these three questions? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I just want to make sure you do it. First question is this. Does your life belong to God? Does your life belong to Him? Yes. Have I dedicated, have you dedicated your life to Him? Yeah. See, this is the one thing that you're going to have to ask. This is the one thing you're going to have to answer. And no one else can answer this for you. Amen. What are you going to do about this little baby? Amen. Am I going to cross that line of faith? Am I going to say, yes, I believe. Here is my life. I give it over to you. Amen. See, this is, this is the first question. you got to ask this. And so for many of us, some of you are in this room and you're like, listen, I just wanted to come to church and hear a nice little, nice little final message for the year and then go on. But you have to make a decision. You have to cross that line of faith. That's up to you. I can't make that for you. So my question for you is this. Have you crossed that line of faith? Now, the rest of you, maybe you've crossed that line of faith. Personal. But maybe you need to th start thinking about rededicating your life to Him. Amen. Maybe this last year you've drifted. Maybe this last year you kind of walked away. Maybe you've done your own thing and you said, listen, forget Him. We're coming back, guys. We're coming back to the, to the major where you have to make a choice. What will I do with Him? Amen. And maybe I need to just rededicate my life will be next. So would you bow with me just for a moment? I've got two more questions we're going to ask, but I want you to bow your heads with me for just one moment. Two, one point, I just want you to think about this. If you've never crossed that line of faith, maybe today is your day that you cross that line of faith. You say, today, I'm going to say, I believe in Him. I'm going to surrender my life over to Him. What He did for me on a cross I surrender. And maybe for some of you, and this, I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes throughout the course of my life, I've had these moments of rededication. And there's nothing wrong with that. Call the sinner, make there's, the same. There is, there is nothing wrong with that. Amen. Where you can, you can say, listen, God, I've drifted. I believe, but I've drifted. And today, I just rededicate my life over to you. And if that's the case, if that is your heart, would you pray with me? Just pray this simple prayer of dedication. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you were willing to come here and die for me. And then rise again. That by faith in you, I can have new life, have my sins forgiven, and have the hope of eternity with you. I give you my heart, I give you my life, and I dedicate it over to you. My life is no longer mine, it is yours. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I ask you to do something? I, I'm going to ask you to be bold here. But for me, that's not just a prayer I recite, that's a prayer I pray today. Just in rededication. Anybody else rededicate their life or dedicate their lives over the Lord? Number, put your hands up. I want to see it. I want to see it. Yeah, yeah. Number of you. Let's give a hand to these guys, all right?
praise the Lord. Amen. 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 A new year. A new year. Yes, there is. A new year. Number two. Second question is this. Do I believe his word to be true? True enough to put it into practice? See, this is exactly what Simeon is trying to say. Is do I believe his word? Not only do I believe it, but am I willing to put it into practice? Jesus taught us in Matthew. He says, listen, the wise man hears my words and puts them into practice. The first question you need to ask is, am I listening to his words? And so my question for you is this. Would you start if you haven't? If you've been distancing yourself from God, maybe you need to get back. Read a chapter a day. Sit down, find a chair, read for 15 minutes, read a chapter a day. So much so that it's one of the applications on this wall, if you can see. It's one of the applications we've said in, in 2015. Even in 2016, we want you to read God's Word. So would you say, listen, I want to read. I've got to read, but not just read it. I'm going to put it into practice. I'm going to walk in His ways. I'm going to walk in His ways. Because my life is no longer mine, it's His. And I'm dedicated over to Him. Even... When things are tough. Right, Mary? Yeah. Even when life gets tough and everybody's coming down saying, what on earth are you doing? Following His Word. It is a lamp unto my feet. A light unto my path. So, do I believe His Word to be true? True enough to put it into practice? That's the second question. The third question is this. Am I willing to tell others that I have found a Savior? Am I willing to tell others that I found a Savior? See, Anna just said, listen, I found him. And she turned and she said, we found him. We found him. See, this is one of the things that you can do. Some of you are a little nervous about that. But listen, just invite them to church. Start there. Say, listen, you got to come. We'll talk about it. We're not afraid about that. But sometimes people are. But you come. You, you can say, listen, come to this place. And we've invited to listen. That's part of the gospel. That application is saying, listen, here is my life. And I'm going to invite. But see the people around me. In the cubicles around me. In the, in the stations around me. At school around me. I'm going to see them as God sees them. That he loves them. And that, that he wants them to know that we have found the Savior. And not only that, maybe you can invite them over for dinner. Invite them over for dinner. Maybe God will give you an opportunity to talk about your faith in Him. And then just look. Look for opportunities. Look for the people around you. God, God knows what He's doing. And He's saying, listen, I'm steering people your way. Don't be silent. Amen. And then He says this. Verse 39. Look at back in Luke chapter 2. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Now they return home. <laughs> I mean, she's been away from home. She gave birth to a little boy in a stall. She's, she's gotten visited by some pretty interesting people. Everybody's now going away. But then God brings these two people and says, God, hey, the story hasn't ended. The story hasn't ended. There is so much more life to be lived. There is so much more to the story. And it says, and the child grew, it became strong, and he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Listen, don't stop here, I think is what he's saying. Don't stop here. Keep reading the story. And your life will be forever changed. Would you pray with me for a moment? God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for what you're doing in our midst. Thank you for the lives of this morning that maybe they rededicated or dedicated their life over to you. And we celebrate that. We pray for, for all of us that we would get back into your word if we're not, but get back into your word and reading, just finding a chair, finding a moment and saying, I want to hear, I want to read, and I want to learn. And God, in that learning, I'll fall in love with you because it's hard not to fall in love with you. So much so that our, our lives, we hope, would be lived out for you. That we would live out your word. And that we would not be afraid or ashamed, but that we would tell others, those around us, in 2016 here, that we have found, we found the Messiah. We found the Savior. His name is Jesus. And not be afraid. Not be afraid. God, we pray that here in 2016, you would explode this church with new people where they're hearing the gospel and lives are being forever changed. Not just our church, but all the churches in our county. That people would find that there is hope. 
that there is hope, that the story doesn't end on Christmas morning, but the story continues on. And He can change their lives as well as He's changed ours. So God, we dedicate and pray for 2016 that it would be a new year, a new year for our church, a new year for this building, this place, this fellowship, this family. That as we celebrated with all the ministry opportunities or relationships that were being impacted this last year, we look forward to seeing you doing even greater things up ahead. We love you. And we pray that you would move in a mighty way. We love you. We commit this to you. And dedicate our fellowship, this family, our lives over to you. And it's in your son's name that we pray. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Happy New Year. All right.